Hi, this is Father Chris Alar of the Marian Fathers here at the National Shrine of the Divine Mercy, and welcome back to Living Divine Mercy here on EWTN. You know, the spirituality of St. Faustina can be summarized in two words, trust and mercy. Now, we all know that mercy is the key to everything, hence the topic of this show, and it's the most important gift of all. But do you know that we can't receive that mercy if we don't trust? We are St. Faustina had total trust in God because Jesus asked her to do things that she didn't think she could do. Sound familiar? Well, she was not an artist, but Jesus told her to paint an image of divine mercy. She had no money, yet Jesus asked her to spread divine mercy around the world. She had no influence, yet Jesus demanded she institute the Feast of Divine Mercy in the Universal Church. So basically, he gave her no real help and held her accountable for the lost souls if she didn't do it. Wow, to whom much is given, much trust is expected. Now, that is why the entire message of St. Faustina's diary and really the Bible are about trust. Trust is so important because it is the opposite of fear something that Satan is using to grip our world today. You know, we are putting fear ahead of everything, including our freedom and even our own salvation by closing churches and refusing to attend the sacraments, for example. Now, yes, while it's important to be prudent, of course, let's not forget the first word spoken by John Paul when he became Pope. Be not afraid which is also mentioned in the Bible 365 times, one for each day of the year, basically. Now, as we mentioned, the entire diary and the Bible are about trust, which is the only way to overcome this fear that Satan wants to control us with. You know, by trusting, we can return to God as Father, to be reconciled back to Him after the fall, rather than just fearing him as some disciplinarian. So what is trust? Okay, trust is simply the expectation of someone's help. I trust that my friends will help me, for example, and accepting their help when they offer it. That is why Mary is so important. From the cross, Jesus offered her to help us. So we need to accept that gift. But why Mary? Well, it actually all goes back to Adam and Eve. You know, in the garden, sin wasn't so much the problem, surprisingly. Not trusting was the problem. They didn't believe God. The serpent gave them a distorted image of God as just a setter of rules, instilling in them fear. You know, Satan is about distrust saying you can only trust yourself. So do it your way, as Frank Sinatra says. But this brings slavery, not freedom, because we seek goods that will never fulfill us. And we keep working like slaves to be fulfilled, which brings unhappiness and fear of this spiral, this endless spiral. You know, in fact, did you know that fear is the number one reason why people don't go to church? They're afraid that God will give them a holy beatdown as hypocrites if they dare to sit in the pew. No. If we are sinners, and we all are, that is exactly why we need to sit in that pew. We need the grace of the sacraments. And by the very act of going and sitting in the pew, we are putting faith into action. And that is what trust is. Trust is a living faith, believing what someone tells you and then acting on it. You know, God tells us in Scripture that we need the church. So act on it. It is not a blind obedience, as our non-Catholic brethren tell us, 
but a loving trust, which shows God we love him. Remember Abraham, when he faced his test, he faced what was considered a test of trust, not just faith. God told him that he would make his progeny greater than the stars of the sky or the sands of the seashore. But Abraham must have been thinking, God, how are you going to make my descendants so great if you're asking me to kill the only boy through which they will come? I don't know how you're going to do this, God, but I trust you, even if you have to raise this little guy from the dead to do it. Now, in a similar way, Mary is the mother of trust. We obtain trust through Mary because she is the new Eve, one who trusts and is obedient, the opposite of the original Eve, the mother of distrust, who didn't believe God and who was not obedient. Instead, Eve feared God. Mary did not fear. Mary is a gift to build our trust. God gave her to us as a mother, a creature just like us, because God knew we would now be afraid, broken after our fall. And as we said, trust is accepting the help someone offers. So that's like accepting Mary's help in the Hail Mary. As we say, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. You know, if we are fearful at death, this means that our hearts um, love the world more than God, and God is our Father. While true, this is natural, it's based on our broken human nature. So let's focus on the world to come more than this world. Remember, we all want to get to heaven, and to get to heaven, we need grace. And to get grace, we need trust, as we've been saying. That's why Jesus told St. Faustina that trust is the vessel by which all grace is received. So we need a way to capture that grace um, as God pours it down upon us. And that vessel, to capture it, is trust. Now, finally, and I think this is very interesting, do you know that God also trusts us? In marriage, he entrusts your spouse to you as well as your children. This is huge. You know, marrying someone means that you have each decided to become a bridge between yourself and your spouse and that bridge of the Father's mercy. Their failings become your opportunities to grow in virtue. Jesus, he also entrusts his very self to us in the Eucharist. He makes himself vulnerable to us, trusting us that we will treat his very body and blood in the most reverent way. And that is why divine mercy is not just about our devotion to God, but his devotion to us. Wow, this is powerful stuff. And maybe that is why Blessed Francis Xavier Silo said, None of the damned was ever lost because his sin was too great, but because his trust was too small. Now, speaking of trust in its ultimate form, a few months ago, we did a story about a town called Westphalia, Michigan, where so many people there are practicing their faith and living it in trust. Well, at that time, we told you that we wanted to do a story about some miracle children in the town just next door called Pawamo, Michigan. Now, we have done many stories, some great stories, but I feel this one may be one of the best because this story of these miracle children is the ultimate example of trust. Come with us now as we visit Pawamo, Michigan.
St. Joseph's Catholic School. And here are the miracle kids today, ready to laugh, learn, and look ahead. You might ask yourself, what are the odds of that happening? <laughs> They're only God's odds. <laughs> They're nobody else's odds. It's just such a beautiful thing. To think about, you know, these four little kids who all had tremendous health challenges, to find themselves in the same little classroom in a little town who all had pretty high-tech care in a town not so far away. I mean, we call these kids the miracle kids, so I'm, I, which I think is perfect. If that wasn't the hand of God, I don't know what the hand of God is. If that wasn't a, a miracle, I don't know what a miracle is. The nurse screamed, stop, I need a doctor. And all I saw was her hanging on with her dear life to that baby running down the hallway. It's very clear in my mind as if it were yesterday. They said, we've done the echocardiogram. You might want to take a look at it sooner rather than later. This pattern was just the Thomas Kramer pattern. <laughs> it was like nothing we'd ever seen. I was devastated. We were both devastated. We cried a lot. I would say Hail Mary, and if I did say the Our Father, I skipped Thy will be done. I didn't want God's will, I wanted my will. I wanted my baby to live. In his 30 years of hospital ministry, Deacon Wayne Charlton knows that questions of faith are really a part of reaching a greater relationship with God. When we're in a relationship, if we have things that are going on that we don't understand, then we ask and we look for clarification. I think the difficulty is then we have the responsibility to sit and listen carefully in order that we know the answer when we receive it. The fact that he survived to be born was really what was remarkable. At Mott's Children's Hospital in Ann Arbor, Dr. Jennifer Romano was on call. Thomas became her patient. I was raised Catholic. I give my trust and faith up to Jesus and that, you know, he's given me the skill and the talent and will help guide me through whatever challenges that I face. I created a trap door basically from his aorta and rotated that over and used that as a tongue of tissue to connect to the descending aorta and then used a patch of homograph, which is basically a cadaver artery, to reconstruct the other part of the blood vessel. Thomas needed more surgeries and may need more still. It was not one miracle that answered Leah and Michael's prayers. We had many little miracles happen. Yeah, and big ones. Yeah, but. little and big. How are you, Thomas? Good. What's been going on? This family is very special to me. I think the future is very bright for him. He's staying active. And emotionally, he's very good. His smile is contagious, and he loves making other people giggle and smile. He wants to be a priest. This is a kid that loves God. And Thomas's place in medical history? He's not just a one in a million. He's a only one. He is such a leader. He always has new ideas. He's always up for anything. He's go, go, go. And the other kids look up to him. He just makes life fun and interesting. October of 2008, Kane was born. And before we left the hospital, the doctor told us that he had craniosynostosis, which basic terms means he was born without a soft spot. So the sutures in his brain were already closed and his brain did not have room to grow. It was stressful for me because the vision of, of what I had in mind changed drastically and I became a little selfish, you know, with God and very quickly I was, you know, I think slapped in the face by the Holy Spirit. I can't change what's going to happen. I can just lay my hands out and say, Holy Spirit, I'm ready for you to guide me, you know, to, to lead me down this, this path. When he was five months old, he had surgery from ear to ear um, to cut open his skull and open up those sutures so his brain would have room to grow.
He's very energetic, sometimes a little too much. He loves being outdoors. He loves hunting and fishing and coming to the farm. The phrase, Jesus, I trust in you, is more present now in my life for sure than what it was even before. You know, maybe our, our plans weren't so different after all. God presented us a test on our faith and our marriage and we succeeded. At six months of age, Maddie George couldn't keep anything down. Dehydration, the doctor said. But mom Kara knew differently. Trained as a nurse in cardiac care, she discovered Maddie's heart sometimes beat faster than she could count. Kara was right. Doctors said Maddie needed a heart transplant within six months or she would die. It was news that George's did not take lightly. The realization that somebody else's child would have to die in order for years to live, I think is just one of those most helpless, um, undescribable feelings you could ever have. You know, we really had to dig very, very deeply into our faith and really trust that God had a plan, um, that this was all part of his plan. Maddie got a new heart one day after her first birthday. Although it was not without complications, it served her well for 12 years. Then a routine checkup revealed that her body was rejecting her heart. I can't imagine being almost 13 and having to, to go through something like this. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us. We did a lot of praying with her and, you know, ask everybody that we knew. I mean, the community has been so amazing. Um, and just, you know, just start praying. They did, gosh, they did. And the lab work came back and they're like, oh, I'm not really sure what happened, but the lab work looks really great. <laughs> you know, and we're like, we know what happened, <laughs> you know. Um, God's performing another miracle here. I-29. Yes. I never really pleaded, like, why us? Why us? Bingo. Stop it. What? In terms of God's miracles, I think it's more, why not us? God will continue to use her as a miracle, and she is such a blessing, and she just makes us smile. She's a light to a lot of people. You know, she's our Maddie. And what a story. Yeah, she's our miracle. When you have a critically ill child, your mind just races. It's like the ultimate puzzle for you to solve. Newborn Brody Smith's diagnosis of leukemia was only the beginning. Needing a bone marrow transplant, the treatments to make it possible also produced what is called VOD, a scarring of his liver. VOD shut down his kidneys to the point where waste pooled in his stomach. At one point, we discussed having a wake. You know, what would we do for wakes? You know, because it looked that dire. And so, the puzzle solving began. Doctors borrowed from surgery for head injuries to place a drain in Brody's stomach and Corey explored herbal remedies to treat infection. It all worked. And there was more good news. Brody's sister and godmother, Macy, was a perfect match of his bone marrow and agreed to be the donor. But if there is one story the Smiths remember best, it is about a small statue in Brody's hospital room, St. Therese. Pray to her, it is known, and she will intercede with Jesus and she will send those who pray roses to show their prayers were answered. Robin had always prayed a rosary on a rosary that was made. The beads were roses. were roses. She asked if those were her roses, and I believe I said to her, no, those aren't your roses. And <laughs> sure enough, she got her roses. The feast day of St. Therese was homecoming at PW High School in you know, Macy's a likable girl. They voted her homecoming queen, and as winning the award, you get a dozen roses. Robin's there with her when she's receiving the roses, and Macy hands Robin the roses. I just thought, oh my gosh, Macy just won, and we got our miracle. To me, it was the final sign of, yes, he is in the clear. Yes, he beat cancer. It's like you almost actually believe it now. like. Yeah. 
Brody is the only pediatric patient here at Mott's that survived BOD. God never wastes suffering. The only reason he would permit suffering is to bring about greater holiness within our community, within yourself. That's the only reason he allows suffering. I keep going back to what Corey Smith said. If I'm gonna go through any type of crisis, there's no place I'd rather be. You wanna raise your kids here. You want them to be a part of this. Strong Catholic values. Never underestimate the power of prayer. I just, you can't. You yeah, just can't. It can move mountains. It really yes. can. It, 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 it has for us. It has for yeah. us. I just pray that I always have a soft heart and will listen to his will. That was beautiful. Today is a special day, for although they might have passed each other in the hospital hallway or taken the same elevators to emergency surgeries, this is the first time all the families have been together. This is an opportunity from God to be able to share our stories with the whole world. And some of them are little miracles um, to other people, but they're giant miracles to us. I hope the kids just stay connected and you know, we picture when they're 16 and driving or graduating high school and, you know, maybe even at each other's weddings, um, just to see them together throughout the years, to grow up together and what they've all been through. We're excited for that. If that wasn't the hand of God, I don't know what the hand of God is. If that wasn't a miracle, I don't know what a miracle is. Wow, there are no words to describe that story. We hope that you can share it far and wide. What a touching and inspirational account of some beautiful children who are now growing into young adults there in Puamo, Michigan. God bless all of you and your families and those who trusted in the Lord's providential care. Now, in the teaching section, we talked a little bit about Abraham. Let's go to the scriptures where Father Anthony reads for us that exact account of Abraham, our father in trust. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here am I. He said, Take your son, your only begotten son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering upon one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Many societies of the Near East believe their gods demanded human sacrifice, and starvation and disease would result if this was not done. In contrast, Abraham trusts God even when the Lord asked him to sacrifice his only son Isaac, through whom the divine promises were to be fulfilled. Abraham believes that God is trustworthy and could even raise the dead to life to fulfill his promises. When the angel stops Abraham at the last moment from slaying his son, God shows that he does not desire human sacrifice at all, only the sacrifice of the heart a complete trust in his will and merciful plan. Pleased with Abraham's unfailing trust and obedience, God reiterates his promise that by your descendants shall all the nations of the earth bless themselves. God will one day fulfill this promise by sending his only begotten son, Jesus, to share our human nature, to carry the wood of the cross, and to offer himself as the perfect sacrifice that sets us free. I see that God never tries us beyond what we are able to suffer. Oh, I fear nothing. If God sends such great suffering to a soul, he upholds it with an even greater grace, although we are not aware of it. One act of trust at such moments gives greater glory to God than whole hours passed in prayer filled with consolations.
With the trust and simplicity of a small child, I give myself to you today, O Lord Jesus, my Master. I leave you complete freedom in directing my soul. Guide me along the paths you wish. I won't question them. I will follow you trustingly. Your merciful heart can do all things. A humble soul does not trust itself, but places all its confidence in God. So thank you, everybody, for joining us for this week's talk on trust. And next week, we will continue this theme of trust because that's what Marian consecration is all about. And that is our topic of next week. So until then, may Almighty God bless you and yours in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>